God richly bless you. Welcome to another Bible study session. Praise God. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I must say that, you know, we have been blessed uh, for the past week or so. We had our national convention and we did have a good time in the presence of God. I, I can say for myself that I was truly blessed. I'm glad that, you know, we were able to come together as a faith apostolic body, amen, faith apostolic ministry body, and, you know, to fellowship and to, to learn from the word and to, you know, just to, just the whole uh, atmosphere was powerful. It was potent. It was, it was good. Amen. And I, and I feel refreshed. I feel revived. Irrespective of what the enemy Amen. Would want to try, uh, has been trying. I must say that we had a great time in the presence of Almighty God. Amen. And as I thought about the whole thing about uh, what we did in that national convention, before we started the convention, we had two weeks of dealing with um, evangelism. Amen. We dealt with the Great Commission from the perspective of evangelism. Now, tonight, we're going to look at the other side. We're going to look at the whole idea of discipleship and new convert care. And why is this important? You're going to realize how important it is. And I'm asking you to, to, to stay tuned and get your pen. Amen. As we try to learn Get your pen, get your book as we try to learn in relation to the whole subject of discipleship. You're going to realize how important it is as children of God, I mean, for us to, to get involved, not just in evangelism, but also in discipleship. Amen. And, and I pray, God, that for this week and next week, that we will uh, try to look at this area and look at how much we can learn in relation to the whole subject of discipleship in a new convert care. Bow your heads as we are about to go into this session tonight. Great God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace, your loving kindness towards us, which is better than life. We thank you, God, that we are able to study your word one more time. We thank you, Lord, just your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. God, as we are about to embark on another Bible study session tonight, I pray, God, for every saint that is here, every person who will tune into this Bible study. I pray, God, that you'll help us, Lord, that we may learn, that we may grow, and we may mature, and we may be able to understand the importance of not just evangelism, but what it takes for us as a church, amen, to, to, to bring forth that great commission that is given to us of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless every saint here as we look to you, the great God of heaven. Thank you, God, for what you're about to do. Thank you, God, for the opportunity for us to break bread one more time in the mighty and the most exalted name of Jesus, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, and let us have a good time in Bible study tonight. God bless you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. And it's in, it, it, it is always good to start with, amen, the words of the greatest teacher that has ever graced the face of the earth. Amen. Uh, the, the, the real rabbi. Amen. You know, it was um, Nicodemus who came to him by night and said, Master, you know, and practically was saying, Rabbi, we know that thou being a teacher come from God. Praise God. So you acknowledge the fact that Jesus was and is Amen. The ultimate teacher, the best teacher, and he knew how to bring across what he wanted. Amen. In the simplest way, but at the same time, they were very powerful in how we did it. So when Jesus uh, died and was resurrected, it's interesting to always find some of the last things that were being said. You know, normally people say when somebody is dying, Amen. Uh, we we want to hear what their last words are. In this context, Jesus had already died and he rose from the dead. He was about to leave. Amen. And he gave his disciples a very important command. He said in Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Praise God. I, I want us to examine the same wording of this particular verse according to the NIV. Remember, you know, a translation uh, is how the interpreter uh, interpreted the Greek. 
all right, in this context in the New Testament. So when the translators for the NIV quoted the same words of the Lord from the Greek, they made this comment, go and make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So based on that particular verse, we recognize that Jesus gave his disciples uh, a very important command. As I said before, these are, some, these are the last words, amen, recorded in the book of Matthew of the Lord, amen. It is called, and we have spoke about this in previous weeks when we dealt with the whole topic of uh, missions, amen. We know that this being the Great Commission. So Jesus made some very important points. Firstly, he says, you must make disciples, amen, of all nations. Look at look at all nations first. It means then discipling, discipleship is not confined to Jamaica alone. When you're making a disciple, it doesn't matter the color of the person. It doesn't matter the race of the person. It doesn't matter who they are. Jesus say, Jesus didn't put a limitation on where we should go and how far we should go. He just said, go and make disciples of all nation i emphasize all because it means then amen in our endeavor to win souls or to make disciples praise god we must do it not with the mindset of just winning persons who are next door to you even though your jerusalem can start there or even to make disciples in the church with persons who are of your uh liking or holding or people that look like you all right but your discipleship should be of all nations but he went on to say make disciples and that greek word there is matatheo and it actually means it is it is a it is it's a verb in the greek and it can be translated two ways two ways all right first of all it means to become a pupil all right so it, when when they talk about make disciples all right you talk about based on the, the greek and the fact that it's a verb it can actually mean to become a pupil praise god so as a disciple you become a pupil it means to disciple it means to enroll as a scholar it means to be disciple it means instruct or to teach um so the greek the word itself can be defined in two ways one it can mean to be a disciple of one in that case, it means that you are the one being discipled. And this is what we'll be jumping on next week, you know, because a lot of times when we hear the whole subject of discipleship, we get the impression that it's speaking of uh, uh, only a set of people, you know. But I have learned many years ago, we had a thing called Advanced Bible Course. And it taught us many years ago that one of the things that we must have as a Christian, it doesn't matter how far you are, in the ranks, it doesn't matter, and I say in the ranks, depending on where you are in king and in the kingdom of God, amen. You should have some level of accountability. So while you are pouring into others, which means that you are discipling others, you yourself should be a disciple. And we're going to talk about that next week. So the first definition means to follow his precepts and instruction. In other words, you are the one following. All right. And this is very, very important. But the other one means to make a disciple. So in that case, you are the one teaching. And, and, and that's where we are uh, going to be focusing on tonight. We'll be looking at the whole subject of us um, doing the discipleship as opposed to being discipled. But I did say, if we can look at it in its general sense, all right, discipleship does not only speak to you passing the information on to somebody else, but at the same time, there should be somebody passing on information to you, all right? While you are pouring into somebody else, you must always have somebody else pouring into you. Uh, um, and, and this is very important. I'll be looking at that as we go further in it. I pray God that at the end of the day, amen, we will understand that discipleship is two ways. It is you being discipled and you discipling somebody else. All right. So very important. So Jesus gave the command and said we must make disciples of all nations, Matthew. Um, and we say that's a verb, which means that we 
are being discipled or we are discipling someone. And how should we do that? He gave us the instruction, one, by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And without going into the whole apostolic doctrine, can we know what that verse means? And, for, and let me just jump there for anybody who is on the, on the call who is um, not necessarily apostolic or will be watching this. Amen. Baptizing them in the name, the word name there is singular, which means that there is one name that's associated to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. So Jesus was not saying he was baptized using the title Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He was actually saying he was baptized in the name that belongs to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right. And we know that that is Jesus himself. All right. So, but in that context, how uh, we are commanded to make disciples two ways. One, through evangelism. That is where we uh, win souls for Christ. And then the second one is that we teach them to observe all things that I have commanded. And the idea is Jesus Christ, which is discipleship. So in one era, we are winning souls. All right. So in one end of the, 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 the cross, we are winning souls for Christ. On the other end of the cross, we are discipling people to observe and to follow uh, the things that Jesus has instructed and has commanded us. Amen and praise God. Praise God. So this is very important as we move into the whole subject of discipleship. Now, one of the things we must understand is that things that happen in the natural uh, seem to reflect what takes place, praise God, in the spiritual. Amen. And, and, and we see that a lot in, uh, in, 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 in how we, in many things. So, for example, if we, the Old Testament was filled with a lot of physical things, which really was just a representation of what God truly wants to fulfill in the spiritual. As a matter of fact, the Bible said the things that, are, 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 that we see with our eyes are, are temporary. And the things that we cannot see, the spiritual things are eternal. So there are some eternal uh, values, some eternal teachings that we can, that we can, uh, that we are pressing for. Something that will lead us into eternity. Uh, praise God! But we can learn these things from things that we see in the natural world. Amen. And then we can apply it over to the spiritual world, which is where we are Christian. But we are not. All spirit. We are phys physical people, but we are physical people who have uh, who serve a spiritual God, and we we know God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So, in the natural, we realize that some things happen in the natural that reflects what God is going to do or what God is doing. Praise God in the spiritual. So, in the natural, having a newborn baby at home is not where the process ends, and um. You know, a lot of people are excited uh, whenever they, they, whenever somebody gets pregnant. You know, um, whenever um, a, a baby is to be born into a family, it, it, it's an exciting thing. Amen. And 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 people look forward um, to having that child be a part of the family. Praise God. But those of us who have had children know that really uh, while the pregnancy lasts for nine months, amen, which is a part of the process, amen, the, the true responsibility of, of, of taking care of that baby, even though it starts from the pregnancy part, but it, it, it only the beginning of many years of responsibility as a parent. So I remember, uh, for example, when I had when I when 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 uh Kristen and Kylie were my two daughters, amen. I remember after Kristen was born, you know, and then when my when Kylie was supposed to be born, I tell you, I'm because I'm fully aware of what is going to take place for the next three months. You know, going to have not you're going to have a lot of sleep, you know, and and as the you're going to take a while before the baby start mellowing and sleep through the night, and all of these things happening, and there's a lot of taking care of, a lot of monitoring, a lot of watching, amen. And so on and so forth, uh, because and 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 it, you know after a while you wean after some of these things, but we know how it goes, amen. And we realize also that after a while, if as they get older and older, like in my case now, I can look. I Christian will will somewhat look after her little sister, um, but she still has somebody looking after her, which is what we will find. We go into the whole era of the discipleship. You can realize that. Every one of us, even if you are not 
a minister, even if you're just safe for two years, you need to be pouring into somebody else while somebody else is pouring into you. I will mention that earlier. Uh, in a similar way, we will find it in the natural world where one child, the older siblings seem to take care of the younger ones in a sense, but the parents take care of everybody. All right. So that is what is happening. So in the natural, having a newborn baby is at home is an exciting thing, is a, is a very powerful thing, is something that we look forward to, praise God, but it's not where the process actually ends, all right? And after a baby is born, then, as I said, begin many years of responsibility as parents, and we know that. Um, so parents have to pour love into the child. Uh, we have to talk about nourishment. We have to talk about protecting that child. We have to talk about training that child until they have reached a place where some of these responsibilities they can take on as an adult. I mean, but even as adults, praise God, there are cases where we ourselves still rely on other people. Um, I, I, I am an, I'm an adult, um, and but at the same time, I still have people in the house of the Lord, who I who I have I look up to, you know, and these people can pour into you, amen, some things, but it's not the same like pouring into a new convert. It's a little different, but there is still some things that they can pass on to you. Amen. Um, so it is said that a baby without proper attention and care may become a sickly child and may even die. And we see that in the physical, where if when a baby is born, you're excited about the baby, you're excited, but if you do not give the baby what is needed, I mean, for them to grow from strength to strength, what is going to happen? They will become sickly. And in some cases, the child may even die because there are some things that are needed to be done. Now, there's a little story that I want to share. Um, it is said that a, a group of, of pastors um, were discussing whether or not to call uh, an evangelistic uh, service. We need to have um, this major evangelistic service um, in crusade in their city. And they just said that one of the persons objected to the whole idea of doing this. And their reason was that the results of these type of meetings do not last. And we have seen that. He said that, look here, at the end of the day, I, I have heard of meetings. He said, this is this, this, is this pastor talking to the group of persons. He said, but I've heard of meetings where uh, hundreds of people are converted. But when you check back the church in one year later, only very, very few remain. But one of the other pastors objected to that. And he says, I have also heard of meetings where many people are converted and a year later, only two remain. So we are left to make our own application um, in, in the sense that what makes the difference in, 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 the, in the two scenarios is simply this. How much care is done, amen, how much, how much is it done to ensure that the persons who come in remain, all right? So we have to ensure that we are handling, amen, the whole idea of new uh, convert care very, very carefully. So Jesus made a very powerful statement. He said, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, praise God, and ordain you that you should go and bring forth fruit. So that is one of the things that we are commanded to do as children of God. We are commanded to go and to bring forth fruit. Amen. But that's not the end of the process. Apart from going forth and bringing forth fruit, we have to ensure that our fruit should remain. And this is very, very important. And this goes back to the story I just said. You know, one pastor was upset at the fact that many people uh, come in, amen, but at the end of the day, only few, uh, in a year or two time, only few are left back. The other pastor is saying, I've seen a flip side to this in other places where many people come, and he, and he points it back to the care that is done at this level, amen. So it is very important for us to do evangelism, but it's also very, very equally important for us to do new converts care. I mean, it's very important for us to do discipleship because at the end of the day, they both work hand in hand, you know? Some people will say my area of expertise is evangelism, and I leave that up to the 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 uh the the pastor to do the teaching and the molding on the inside. My ear is just to preach and just get them in, and I'm going to hand it over to the pastor. While other people might say the, the flip side, 
I'm really concerned about the, the people that are inside church. And I want to ensure that these people that are inside church remain in church. So I leave the work of the evangelist to the, uh, of evangelism to the evangelist. But I, can I say to you that the, the two are very, very important and two are the command of the Lord. Jesus said in Matthew 28, as we say, go ye therefore and make disciples of all men, baptizing them. I would say that is evangelism. And who did he give that command to? His disciples. He did not separate the processes. There is a truth to it that some persons are given the, the, the office, amen, the ministerial office of an evangelist. That is true. But at the same time, and Paul said that we must all do the work of an evangelist. All right. Right? So in the end of the day, each and every one of us have to can't see ourselves as, as excluding a part of the work. So while we are doing evangelism, which is to go forth and to bring forth fruit, we also have the responsibility that we ensure that the fruit that we bring in remain. And can I tell you something also? There is a thing like this. It is said that you produce after your own kind. So Normally, in many cases, you will realize that people who are, are teachers and, 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 and love the word and are into the word and into preaching and into that, when they, when they go out there and they win souls, especially whoever the disciple after that process tend to have a way of, of going in that similar direction. I, I can speak for my own self because I remember years ago, this, there's a brother who, who won me to Christ. I was uh, in the eighth grade of Calabar High School at the time. He was in sixth form. And, and, and I remember watching him and the other guys at the time doing evangelism in Calabar, turning the school upside down. And it, it, it sparked something in me. I remember these young men sitting down and discussing the word. And, and, and that was something that was passed on to me in the sense that I, 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 I got a love for the word of God. So they brought forth fruit and they, they brought forth fruit after their own kind, but they didn't hold that. They ensure that their fruit should remain. I remember one time I was, I was, we were going on, they were going on fasting and can, and I can tell you this, I felt like I was dying. But what had kept me at the time was the fact that these bigger brothers were there and they, 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 they ensured that when they were going on witnessing and when they were going to discuss the word, you know, I was the youngest in the group. I was, as I said before, I'm in eighth grade. These guys are in sixth form. Amen. And, and, and they were, as far as I'm concerned, they were big, big young men. Amen. Anywhere they were going, I would have gone with them. Amen. To discuss the word and stuff. So at the end of the day, I realized that what had happened is that because these young men were into the word and into, into discussing Bible and talking about the oneness of God and, and we would sit down and we'd discuss anything and, and we had a way of, of, of how we dealt with the word in Calabar. I mean, we, any topic I mean, that, that came up, we, we, we studied it out. We ensured that we tried to, to, we want to win souls so much for the Lord. We were so zealous that we didn't even go to stuff like ISCF because we, we didn't see ourselves mixing with anybody else. When we say separation, we were separated. Amen. And we ensured that we dealt with everything. Um, even the Adventists were afraid of us at school because when we were together, we were a team to record with. But I was the youngest in the group and I learned from them. So God said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and what? Bring forth fruit and that what your fruit should remain so we have a responsibility based on what jesus is saying to bring forth fruit but not only that we shall have also have a responsibility to uh under god to ensure that our fruit should remain bearing in mind that the, that at the end of the day there are cases there are cases where and and where people will walk out of the house of God and you have no control of it because really uh, and I'm just showing that in here so so people don't feel guilty having tried and people still leave because even Jesus himself Amen he had twelve disciples I always say that and Judas still betrayed him um, we saw a case where Jesus preached in Saint John chapter six and the Bible said many of the disciples left him and only twelve were left and Jesus said where else go I'm saying where else can we go you are the one that have that the words of eternal life. So at the end of the day, amen, you can do your best. But what you have to do is to, and I will show you what we do as, 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 as a church to ensure that saints remain. So go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. He said, being confident of this very thing, 
that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, as Christians, when they come in, the aim is to, is to ensure, amen, under God, that they, they, they grow from strength to strength. Amen. The work that God has begun in them, God wants to continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. In, in other words, they have come to a place of maturity in God. Amen. And that's our aim in establishing new convert here. Now, in today's study, we're going to address four things. Four things uh, for the sake of time. What exactly is new converts here? All right. Why do we need to do it? How do we do it as a church? All right. And we're going to look at what is called the power of mentorship. Amen. You're going to realize each and every one of us needs somebody. Amen. To, to, we have to be a mentee to somebody. Amen. And we have to be a mentor to somebody. Amen. And, and these two play a very important role in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter how big you are, no matter, matter where you sit. Amen. I strongly believe even pastors need pastors uh, for accountability. I strongly believe that saints need persons who, are, who they are accountable to. Amen. And at the end of the day, we can realize that when we have these things in place, amen, it fosters the whole thing of discipleship. But we're talking about new convert care. So what is new convert care? Why do we need to do it? And how do we do it as a church? Amen. I will look lastly in closing, which going to filter us into next week, the whole issue of the power of mentorship. We're passing it on. All right. Praise God. So what is new converts care? Now, the whole new converts care can be defined. Uh, we will define, first of all, discipleship as the conservation and the maturation and the multiplication of the fruit of evangelism. All right. So that is what discipleship is. We're conserving what we have won. We are making them mature. Amen. And then we are going to multiply. All right. So what we are going to do, we people that come into the house of God, how can we conserve? How can we keep them? Amen. And then after kept keeping them, we don't want people to be in church. Amen. One of the reasons why sometimes church don't grow, amen, is not that people don't come in. Amen. But you realize that people come in and they are there. So conservation sometimes is okay. They love the music. They come to church every Sunday. But that's 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 not, that. it must go beyond that. There must be a case of maturing. And maturing have to do with how do they get into the word? Where are their, their lives as it relates to their walk with God? So on. And then what is there? How do they view the whole era of multiplication? Because you have to produce after your own kind. Amen. And, and Jesus himself had a problem. Jesus went to a particular tree. Amen. And he was not producing fruit. And Jesus cursed the tree because it is supposed to produce fruit. In St. John 15, Jesus said, if you don't produce fruit, you're, you're, you're going to cut you off and cast into the fire and let you be burned. He's a Telling you clearly that as children of God, our aim is not just to be saved, but we must multiply. We must mature and then we must multiply. And these things are very important. So we must know there is no continuing New Testament evangelism without discipleship. So while we can evangelize, amen, we have to add to it the whole thing of discipleship and under the whole big umbrella of discipleship is the whole thing of new converts here so paul writing to the church of ephesus he said this and he gave some apostles some prophets some evangelists and some pastors and teachers why for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ amen till we all come into the unity of the faith Praise God and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. So he's telling you the role, amen, that this uh, ministerial offices should play. And, and we can expand that, amen, to say what the church should play, amen. So the NIV, the Amplified Version says this, till we all really reach mature manhood so the purpose of having this type of thing is to ensure that we reach maturity the completeness of the personality which is nothing less than the standard height of christ's own perfection so the measure of the statue of the fullness of the christ and the completeness found in him that is what the, the amplified version quote is till we come 
uh, to mean that we have to reach a place of maturity, a place of completeness, a place of perfection that comes in Christ. And that's the purpose of the church. Amen. That each and every one of us, the saints that come in, praise God, that we bring them to a state of maturity, that we bring them to a state of, 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 of being measured to the statue of the fullness of Christ. Amen. That's what God, our measuring stick is not, not even pastor daily. Our measuring stick is, is none of the ministers. Our measuring stick is Christ. And therefore what we are doing and what the ministers are doing is supposed to bring people to that measuring stick. Not against what I think, what I feel, but my measuring stick should be against Christ. My measuring stick should be him and him alone. Amen. And at the end of the day, we are saying that we ourselves who have been discipled to reach that measuring stick should also disciple new converts to bring them to that level of maturity because that's the aim uh, that they come to this measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. So new converts care now. Let's let's break that down uh, as it relates to the whole definition of discipleship. We're, we're putting a sub-definition, but specifically to the area, praise God, of discipleship. So new converts care can be defined as the parental care given to new converts to bring them to a spiritual maturity and fruitfulness. So that's it. New converts care can be defined as the parental care. Just like oh, as a parent, I have to ensure that I care for my children, amen, to ensure that they grow, and they get the necessarily nourishment that they need. And, and, and caring for a child, we all know that caring for a child is not just um, giving them food. There, there are so many factors that are involved in caring for a child um, that we're going to look at. Amen. But at the end of the day, our aim is to the same way like in the physical, the parent have to care about the nourishment and the love and the training and all these things for the child. The similar way, the new converts um, as spiritual parents, and Paul defined himself as such, should ensure that the new converts uh, reach a spiritual level of maturity and fruitfulness. Fruitfulness means that they also can produce like you. Amen. And we saw that with Paul and Timothy. I will go along as we go there. So the church, praise God, is called to do two things at the end of the day. We are called to be, if you can look, I remember I said they are the physical and the spiritual. So in the physical, there's what is called obst obstetrician, all right? And then you have the pediatrician. So the first doctor is the one that is, is specializes in delivering babies and caring for, for people during pregnancy. Amen. That, that's, that's, that's what that doctor does. So at the end of the day, the church has to ensure that when they go on these crusades and they go there and, and they, are, they are witnessing to people, amen, they, they, they're trying to, 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 to deliver babies. We see some people there are, are fighting to ensure that babies are delivered successfully. Amen. But at the same time, our role, I must say, does not stop at us being that doctor that delivers baby. We have to be pediatricians also. And that is the doctor who focuses on the health of the infant, the child, the adolescent, and the young adult. Notice that it is more along the category of young, uh, young people. Amen. And when they go older, you probably take a bigger doctor, but the pediatrician focuses on that. So what we do, we apply spiritual pediatrics by ensuring that the newborn saints grow in a healthy way. Uh, Sometimes, if, if the baby gets warm, you come to the doctor, you, you, you know, certain things just to ensure that the child is properly taken care of. There is some tenderness that comes into taking care of that child that is so important in a similar way in the spiritual of us taking care of the new convert. All right. So like a baby in the natural for the new convert to grow, they must have love. And this is very important because uh, when they leave the world, all right and they come into the church, there is an expectation that they have in their minds, all right? There is going to be love, and we as a church need to start showing love. We have to give them food, we have to give them care, and we have to give them training. And we're going, we're going to try to dissect this a little bit, but these are very important. Now, I saw this on a website, and I took it down because I found that some of these things are very important. One, if you're going to spend a lot of time around newborn beings, you're going to realize that they are very fragile and they may be intimidating at the same time. But there are some basic things that 
as that just like you would do to a newborn baby, you have to ensure that you do this for the new convert because you want to ensure that they grow and they, there are some things that are not injected into their spirit. So in the natural, before you go on a baby, you normally sanitize, you wash your hands. All right. In other words, you have to be very careful uh, of the, the, the things that you pass into a new convert. All right. So I, I always tell people that the new convert is a very fragile person. Uh, you have to ensure that you, you do whatever you say around them. You have to ensure that how you conduct yourself as a senior. Is, 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 is really at where it should be uh, because you run the risk of just like in the in the, the, the physical there's infection as it's passed when you because of germs or whatever the case you run the risk of defiling amen this tender new convert by not applying some natural natural things in the spirit they will support the head and the neck. So the, the head of the, the new convert, amen, what they think. You have to give them the word. You have to ensure that they understand, praise God, what is needed of them as children of God. You support them. You never shake a new bomb with a, uh, in play and frustration. In other words, or how you deal with the new convert. Because remember, they are coming from the world, amen, and even there, there, there are certain ways that they conduct themselves. Like I tell people all the time, I, I've heard where people go to new converts. I said, what a tell we come at church, you know, not understanding that um, the new convert probably don't even have anything else to wear. Remember then, they are new converts, all right? And they, they, they're just coming in. They don't have as much clothes as you. They don't have as much stuff as you. So just like you would not uh, uh, shake a newborn baby or, or play with it or, or in a lot of frustration or whatever the case is. And because by just, just by shaking it too hard, you can damage the person in a similar way. When a new convert comes in, you allow them, you allow God to work from the inside out, not from the outside in. I always tell people this. In, in, in other words, it is the best when, 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 when they become convicted based on what they see based on what they learn, amen, and they become convicted of some things, then you try to impress it on them, one. And two, if you try to, to even rebuke them as new converts, um, you're going to realize that you might end up losing some of them because at the end of the day, you're dealing with very fragile people. So um, you are shaking can cause bleeding in the brain and even death. Same, similar thing. You dealing with a new convert wrongly, amen, can cause that person to walk out of the house of blood and never come back because you you don't understand. Um, some I've heard of, of of people who are pastors today, and when they came to church, I remember one pastor. He had to wear his mother's blouse to church, mother's blouse, because he never have no church clothes. The man was so zealous, but he walk come to church. Imagine somebody walk up to him and say, "What did you wear?" You understand? Hurt the man' feelings. They probably make the person feel a way. We praise God at the end of the day, but we have to be cognizant that these are new converts and this is what they are wearing. Amen. Some of them that have no skirt, some of them still wear them chain, whatever the case is, they may have them earring, but allow God to work from the inside out on them. Amen. And not you try to impress from the outside in. And this is very, 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 very important, brethren, for newborn babies. Praise. I'm not talking about adult saints who know better. I'm talking about people who are babies in Christ who just come into the kingdom. They are coming from an old system into this new one. If everything is new for them, allow God, amen, and as you work with them, amen, for them to grow into a level of maturity. Secondly, make sure your baby is secure, fastened uh, in, in, in seats and whatever. In other words, how you, how you deal, a this comeback, limit any active that would be too rough or bouncy. Same way like in the physical, you have to ensure that the baby is not, you know, ruffled too much. In a similar way, the new convert cannot be ruffled too much. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to make a lot of mistakes. Amen. How they walk, the things that they say. I mean, a man come from the world, you're not going to expect him to talk churchy. He might come in and say, yes, me. You understand? You have to understand that that's how they used to talk. I mean, eventually, I mean, what you do is speak the correct thing around them. Amen. And you teach them. Amen. And eventually they will learn. They will learn church. They will learn the, the vocabulary of church. They will learn how to speak and so on and so forth. But until then, I mean, don't rebuke them and chastise them and make them feel away because that's how they express some of them that is express themselves. And we have to just work with that. Remember that your new bomb is not ready for rough plays such as being jiggled or the knee or thrown into the ear, all this type of thing. They're not ready for this type of thing. Amen. So um, people, uh, you have a way of saying, and, and I guess pastors would know this, that you don't deal with every saint the same, all right? Because depending on where they are, amen, 
for example, as a leader, when you do certain things, if Bishop would call you as a state, I'm sure he's going to deal with your heart. Worse if you have been been in certain level of leadership in the church and so on. Him call you, you make certain mistakes. He can deal with it at part, practical level because you know better. Amen. But when you hear a child does something, uh, you 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 sometimes you you correct them, but you correct them a little different than you would uh an a, a older child. I, I would know that in parenting, we deal with each child differently, depending on where they are, depending on the stage of development, all of these things. Similar thing in the physical, the same applies in the uh, spiritual. So what we do, praise God, we must know that neglect, we must never neglect them though. Um, so that's another thing. We bring them in, we can't neglect them. So neglected children usually get sick. I would say they often die, we quote that earlier. So that's one sign. But another thing that can happen, if they actually live, many of them become delinquent. Same thing happening in the spiritual. So you have people in the physical who they, 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 they become disrespectful, they become uh they give the most problems and so on and so forth. And it's just based on the fact that they were neglected. So some people, that the, 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 the neglecting can be a message for physical neglect. So you give them uh, you give them everything that they get, they need. They get the proper food, they get the proper thing, but the, the caring and the whatever else that they should need, I mean, uh, you realize that the child grows up, they, they grow up with um, different other deficiencies. All right? So that's why it, 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 there, there, there should be a whole... A uh, spectrum of things that should be done to ensure that his child uh, grows. So Paul, uh, writing to a couple of the churches, spoke about this. He, he presented himself as a spiritual parent um, to those he won to Christ. And it, 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 I think that he is a good example um, in how he, when he wrote his letter, for example, he was the one who established the church at Corinth. We know that from the second missionary journey. He established the church at Galatia. He established the church at Thessalonica. So these are the places. So when he was writing back to them, we can look at how Paul dealt with them, amen, as his children, he being the spiritual father. So we can look at these examples from scripture and try to see how best we can follow some of these things. So for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, from verse 15 to 16, says, For though we have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So he was saying that I am the one that won you in. So in other words, I am the spiritual father here. And he said, Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. So in other words, here is he he's showing you how he deals with uh, the new converts. He said, look here, I am your spiritual father. And therefore, I am the one who, you have many instructors, you have many parents, but at the end of the day, I am the only father, physical father of Christian and Kylie, all right? At the end of the day, you might have, the, you can have other people who can guide them, but the ultimate responsibility, amen, of Christian and Kylie is mine. At the end of the day, the same thing applies to us in uh, the church, all right? The, to the church of Galatia and Thessalonica, said, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I love that scripture. He was saying, I travail in birth, praise God, until Christ be formed in you. So he's telling you the ultimate aim of him dealing with the church here at Galatia. He's travailing in birth with them again until Christ. That's the aim. He wants Christ to be formed in them. That's the ultimate aim of the parent to ensure that the child grows up into something responsible. In a similar way, the ultimate aim of the spiritual fathers of the new convert here in church is to ensure that the children in church, and I say children, children is not in terms of age, children, you know, is people who are new converts, grow and Christ is formed in them. You say in the church of Thessalonica, as you know how we exhort and comfort and charge every one of you as a father does his children. Not to say that, that you would walk worthy of God, what call you unto his kingdom and glory. So he's saying, I exhort and comfort and charge. Not the term. He exhort them, he comfort them, he charge them, which is very important as a spiritual father. He exhort them. In other words, he gives them uh, uh, words of that would press, would, would, would encourage them to move forward. In comfort them in the times so they can realize that they're going to have ups and downs. I'm going to talk about that in this lesson. But him also charge them that, that they should grow in God, that they should move from strength to strength in him. Amen. That they should walk worthy of God, what called into his kingdom uh, 
and glory. So at the end of the day, it shows you that Paul had a, had a burden for the new converts. He had a burden for the saints. When Paul uh, established the church, amen, he did not just go to these churches and, 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 and just establish them like that and leave them. In his second missionary journey, he wanted to go back. It was not to the third that he actually went back to most of these churches, amen, that he had established and told that he can uh, not only say, he wouldn't be a, a delinquent father. Amen. He, he got them in, but he also took care of them, which is what parents do. You get a child, you take care of the child. All right. Even to this day, we know that in the physical, if a father doesn't do that, or a parent doesn't do that, they can be charged. Amen. In the case of the father, you have to give ch child support just to ensure that certain things are taken care of. And it's funny, you know, that these things happen in the physical and we should look at it and realize that a lot of us have become spiritual delinquents. We have become people who have neglected our children and God is going to hold us responsible uh, uh, for the things that we have done. People come into the house of God and we neglect them. But as each and every one of us as children of God, anytime a new convert comes in, it is your responsibility as an older sibling is your responsibility as a father is your responsibility as a pastor as a minister to ensure that they at the end of the day walk worthy of god what called you into his kingdom and glory now why do we need new converts here we mentioned it earlier there are practically four basic needs that the child needs four needs that they the child needs to for, for overall uh we call it growth uh so the child will need love the child will need nourishment the child will need protection and the child will need training so jesus made a very powerful statement uh he said in saint john 15 12 this is my commandment and this is talking about the need of love that you love one another as i have loved you praise god this is my commandment that you love one another as i have loved you my god this is powerful in other words Jesus is telling us that, look here, in a similar way, and this is how Jesus is passing it on. Jesus is saying that as a spiritual parent, we are to love our spiritual children as Christ would love them. In other words, just as how Christ loved you, you are supposed to love, and that's a, that's a serious, serious, very serious command. Um, a lot of time I thought about it and I realized that one of the issues that we are having in this um, time, and it's something that is resting on my heart, Clearly, no, is the whole issue of love. Amen. We don't understand that there is a need for love in the body. Amen. So a lot of people come in and a lot of people go out because they say, "What a love in a church should not be." The hallmark of the church is love. Just by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Um, you you, you have a look at some families, and no matter how they they they, they have their issues in some families, that is. If you dare to go in there and trouble one of the siblings you're in problem, because at that point in time, they come together, you touch my brother, you touch my sister, you know, that type of thing. That's the type of thing we're supposed to have for each other. Anytime any devil, anytime any enemy comes in to trouble any saint of the most high God, worse the younger ones, which are the ones that we we, we, we must have that type of love that we would want us to ensure that look, nothing can harm them. Amen. That love that says, look here, there is some protection. That love that says, look here, I'm for you. So this love is a necessity for successful parenting. And it's usually missing when discipleship fails. So normally, whenever there is a failure in terms of the what is happening in the house of God, check the whole area of love. Amen. In order for, for, for parenting to be successful, there have to be love. Children, no matter what they get, no matter what they get, and I started here, no matter what they get, if they don't get love, it, 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 it's going to be a very big lacking. And this is in the physical. Uh, and many people complain, you know, my parents gave me everything, but they didn't give me love. But let's still, if the parents give them love, it's like you gave them everything. Because the truth be told, you know, love means that you will do everything in your possible, in your power to ensure that this one is taken care of. Amen. Love, as the Bible declare in uh, First Corinthians uh 13, it, it gives out a, a good place. Love is kind, love is patient. You know, love is, love sees no evil. Love, love, love does seek its own. All of these things, that's how it comes out when the parent loves the child. Amen. And that's what happened. Christ's love must be the foundation of all attempts to give parental care to spiritual babies. It has to be 
the agape love, the love that pass on from the parent to the child. In other words, for 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 us to exceed in the whole era of 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 new converts here, it must be a case where the, whoever the church loves the new converts, love them. Parenting without love will produce unbalanced and distorted lives. We said that a while ago. If there's no love, it will produce unbalanced and distorted lives. In a similar way, for the saint of God, amen, we have to love them. And when we say love them, love them, love them with what they have. Love them with the fact that they don't know a lot. Love them with the fact that just like he would love a baby, amen. And there are certain things that we are, that our expectation of a baby is not the same as an expectation of a teenager, which is not the same as an expectation of an adult. Apply the same in the spiritual realm. Amen. When a new convert make, make, make mistake, correct them, but correct them in love with the understanding of where they are. Praise God. And since knowledge must precede love, time should be spent with a new convert to get to know him and love him. In other words, in order for you to truly love that person, you don't know that there's a there's there is a there's a bonding that takes place between a mother and a child. And that bonding only takes place when the mother spends time with the child. Right? And the more time the mother spends with the child, there's a lot of mothers that after they come out for this uh, maternity leave, they want to go back home because they might think about them baby, they might think about this. That is if they have the real, the, the bonding that takes place, the love. There must be a bond between the child and the parent. I tell you earlier that as a new convert, I remember, my bigger, I call them bigger brothers, there was a bond that took place. I felt the love. I felt the protection. I felt that like these guys were looking out for me. Amen. And, and when I never understood some things, I felt, I felt this, this, this place where I could easily ask them. If I make a mistake, I could easily tell them about it without feeling condemned. Amen. And they would guide you in, to, in terms of because you are a new convert. Amen. And they would guide you and they would, they would, they would tell you to go along, along a particular path. Worse, they have they have, they have run the race ahead of you and therefore they, they, they know where you should walk and where you should walk, what you should say and what you shouldn't say. And they will guide you along. That's what love is. That's what your, your, your knowledge of, of what is going to come or what is going to come. Uh, praise God. You can guide that particular person. At the same time, in order for them to grow, I mean, we have to realize that sometimes as a babe, I mean, while we are not, while we are not uh, going to, 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 not allow them to fall sometimes because that's what will happen with the baby. The baby will learn to walk. We, we see it in the natural. Your, your parents will stand up and they will watch the baby. I will see them wiggle them foot and them try and then fall upon the bottom. Sometimes them cry. Sometimes you not pay them the mind because you, 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 you realize that if you pay them too much mind, sometimes amen, they become dependent on that. So where do you, you, you know, turn your head sometimes where you make sure so them are right because you, know, you care and you love. Amen. I see them get up and them try to walk. I, 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 I like that days when I used to see Till eventually them start moving around the house and touch up everything. Oh God, help us, Jesus. But at the same time, as children of God, praise God, in a similar way, just like it happens in the physical, the same thing they have. The real excitement will happen when they learn to walk. Praise God. In a similar way, the new convert just start get some things done and see some things happening. They're going to be excited. I will be excited with them and cheer them on. I bet them know you have done a good job. Praise God, under God. They go up there and they minister for the first time. They make a lot of mistakes. Amen. But don't condemn them and tell them all the theology that you know. Praise God. Encourage them. Praise God. So that they can grow from strength to strength in God. The second thing is the need for nourishment. Jesus come on Peter three times. Feed my lamb. Them say, feed my sheep. Them say, feed my sheep. There's a reason why he said this. Because I, I, I note the emphasis on feeding. Amen. The baby care. The baby needs certain nourishment. Amen. They need breast milk. They need uh, they need all of these things to ensure that they grow. So the babe in Christ needs to be fed regularly with right kind of food. Amen. Um, if you give them the wrong kind of food, it might hurt them. Even though food in general is important, amen. Babies can't handle every type of food. Amen. Uh, I would not give a newborn babe yam. Amen. Or 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 or, or, or certain type of things because guess what? It might hurt the child and cause more damage, even though it is food that an adult would eat. Amen. It is not the same food that a baby would eat. So as a new, there are certain things you have to ensure that as a babe in Christ, amen, when there's a babe in Christ, you feed them the right things, you give them the right foundation so that they can they can learn something that they can build. Amen. Uh, there are certain things you would not expose them to. Amen. Because at the end of the day, it might just cause more harm than good. So you have to prayerfully, and that's why they should be 
a prayerful new convert program that is put into place to ensure that certain things are taught to the child and the proper foundation is built over probably a one year or one and a half year period. Uh, the Bible says, as newborn babes must desire what the sincere milk of the word, you know, says the sincere meat. Amen. I remember Paul rebuking the church in Hebrew, well, the right of the book of Hebrew, was rebuking the saints of Hebrew church, amen, or the Hebrews in the book of Hebrew, were saying that when you should be uh, eating meat, you're drinking milk. So you're at a time where they stop drinking milk, amen. It would be crazy for you to be saved for 20 years, amen, I you still drink milk. That's a problem. But if somebody's saved for two months or a month or a day, don't expect them to go into deep theology. No, you feed them the sincere milk of the word that they want, may grow thereby. Then there's also a need for protection. The Bible said, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. So Satan himself, the Bible said, is transformed as an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing that his ministers also be transformed as a ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, look at this. This is a very important verse because as new converts, we have to ensure that we protect them against the enemy himself. Praise God. So the new convert is open to a season of attack. And the devil knows that if he can uh, get them defiled at this young age, he, has, he can cripple them for life. All right. And I can tell you that Satan is far more dangerous as a mock angel than as a roaring lion. That is why as new converts, amen, I try to encourage them. And everything for YouTube if you watch and everything and every people we see out there do some things means that you must follow it. Amen. Because guess what happened? The devil appears as an angel of light. Amen. And the mock angel, I said before, is far more dangerous than the roaring lion. Some of these things that we see on YouTube and some of these, 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 these uh, televangelists and some of these people that, 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 that people running down, we have to guard our new converts against these things because once, amen, they become crippled by this junk food, amen, it's going to be hard for us to, to, to pull some of these things out of them. So as I'm saying, as newborn beings, we set up a program to ensure that we grow them, amen, and we, we, we remove them from the exposure of the devil. Amen. The devil's aim is to starve them and to make them weak. So he wants to feed them with things that they don't need. And once he can get them malnourished, amen, you can realize that it can affect them for life. All right. So he tries to starve him into weakness. There are some things that out there look good enough. And, and, and you convert, you run down everything and they want to go everywhere and they want to do everything because they're so excited. Amen. But we know as children of God what is for what is what is good and what is bad. As you grow in God, you know that some things are, it's not everything where it's a gospel is gospel, all right? And 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 and, and, and it's not everything where, 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 where sound good means it's Christian music because at the end of the day, it might cause more harm than good. Praise God. So as children of God, we have to protect them from the mocking angel of the devil, amen, which is, which is even more dangerous than the roaring lion of the devil. Amen. There are some things that are, uh, we, it is obvious to the obvious to us that this is the devil at work, but there are also some things that will come away and you're not sure if it's the devil at work. And this is where the spirit of discerning come in, the discerning the spirit that is at work. So as an older saint, we have to ensure that our new converts are protected. Then there's the need for training. Amen. The spiritual prayer must train a new convert to build his life and eternal on material uh, that would give them the right foundation in Christ Jesus. Amen. So there are a couple of things that we have to ensure that we train them on. One, we must train them on how to witness and evangelize. So a critical aspect of abiding is bearing fruit. So while they come in as new converts, one of the, one of the things that we teach them in the curriculum is the whole era of evangelism, that they also should abide in Christ, abide in divine, but at the same time bear fruit. So what will happen is that, and I saw this quote, he said, evangelism lead us to teach people to obey. And teaching people to obey leads them to evangelizing. It's like a circle. Amen. So if you, as a new convert, 
You're going to teach them evangelism, teach them how to obey. Amen. And then one day when they learn to obey, then you can eventually go back into evangelism. It's like, it's like that's how it works. You, 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 you teach them how to be good Christians. You teach them how to be the word of God. You teach them how to grow in God. And at the same time, it goes right back where it goes right back to evangelism, where you teach them also to do evangelism, which is what we ultimately want them to do. So we teach them the ultimate uh, that witnessing and evangelizing is very important, even as new converts. Um, and sometimes what we have to do is to ensure that some when you're going on certain uh, trips or, or if you have house to house ministry and, and you try to encourage your new converts to get involved in mission, amen. But when they get involved in mission, they are not being thrown out into the deep. They always have mature persons with them. There, there's, a, there's a method that I see the Jehovah's Witness do, and I think it's effective. I mean, while I don't condone the, the, the theology, I still look at the method. If you notice when they travel, they have young one, then they have a senior one, all right? And sometimes when the young one come to talk to you, they, they like, I've had this example, you've had this before where they, they come to my house and, and normally when they come to, I, I pray my heart and if I feel let let them come, I say, yeah, man, come in. Most times I do, let them come in because I want to at least share the word with them. And they come and they sit down and there's one that talk, obviously this one is in training. There's a senior one who's there. Um, and then the senior one, whenever you start getting to certain things, the senior one will probably try to take over. So sometimes that's how you train them. You, you, you have a junior and a senior. So the junior one goes with the senior one. That's his, that's his, that's his new convert scary now. Because what you're doing, you're training this one to do evangelism in, under the care of somebody who has been seasoned into an evangelism. So guess what happened now? You're, 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 you're building this one. I mean, while this one is even learning as well. And, and that's how it works. So that's the importance of teaching them how to witness and how to, because the, the need for training, because there's a need for them to learn how to witness and to evangelize. The second thing is the importance of self-sacrificing. So we have to train them in the area of, 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 of being, uh, making themselves a sacrifice for God. So the business of kingdom must take precedence in the life of every child of God. So one of the things they must teach a new convert is that, look here, uh, what the training they must ensure that they have is that they learn that they themselves must be a sacrifice. So Paul said in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, and here is he writing to the church at Rome. And note, we all know that Paul, well, most of us, some of us know that Paul did not establish the church at Rome, but he's writing to them and he's saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's similar way. This must be the teaching that we pass on to the new converts. Let them understand that in the kingdom of God, amen, the, the, the self-sacrificing is very important. There are going to be some things that you need. There are going to be some, not, uh, there are some things that you want that are out there. But in but what the kingdom dictates is should take full preeminence over anything that you want. Amen. The child might want some things, but we have to, we, we are, as the parents, must be able to pass on to the child, okay, this thing is not good for you. This is what you should get. But, and we have to teach them these things as they grow. So that's training. We train the child, look here. You don't have to want everything that you say. Um, you go to school. Like if my child come home and say, boy, um, I want, I want a Nintendo. Or oh, why do you need a Nintendo? Because my friend John Mark have a Nintendo. No, that's not how it works. It is important. Look, you're not everything that everybody else have you need. Similar thing happen in Christendom. You pass on and you train them um, how to self-sacrifice. The importance of, of, of number three, well, number three, this should be number three, the realities of the Christian walk and the need for endurance. No, but I, I, this is very important because one of the things I realize is that Sometimes when people come into the house of God, we give them the impression, amen, like the house of God is a place of utopia, is a place where they will never uh, have any struggles at all. Nothing that will happen to them again. When you get saved, you're on cloud nine. From now till you're going to just float right into the pearly gates. Amen. But we know that is not true. And therefore, one of the things we have to do is teach them the reality of the Christian walk and the need for endurance. So Jesus made a very important statement. He says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there will be many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate and, uh, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few that find it. So in essence, Jesus was commanding his disciples to enter the way marked by persecution, but there is a reward that comes at the end. So we have to tell the child of God, look here, the Christian walk, 
when you start this Christian work, you're not going to be on cloud nine every day. You're not going to be up all the time. There are going to be times where you feel weak. There are going to be times where you feel like you're discouraged. There are going to be, there are going to be times where you're going to feel like, like, like you're alone. But guess what happened? You have to, you have to tell him, like, look here. As Paul said to his son, Timothy, ye and all that are will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So there are going to come times if you try to live godly for God, if you try to live a Christian life, the devil in that way will walk past you. Amen. He's, you're going to try to attack you. But guess what? As a child of God, the reality is that, look here, whatever we suffer in this world is, is minute in comparison to the glory which is set before us. So many Christians, I've said before, become discouraged when they encounter challenges on their Christian walk. I mean, and many times due to the fact that uh, I've said Christians is presented as a utopia um, and that all your problems are going to vanish away. Um, and they expect to be happy and they expect to not have a fear in this world. And we know as children of God, and it's important that we do not deceive them as new converts. We must realize that they will have the same issues, praise God, they will have the same problems, amen, Like just like the world goes through. They will have, um, and trust me, they will even have additional problems. Guess what? At the end of the day, tell them your testimony. Tell them what you have gone through. Make them understand that even when they're going through the valley, Jesus is with you. Amen. And he's going to lead you by side still waters. And he's going to carry you. and going to restore your soul. And, and, and sometimes you're going to have a valley experience. But in the valley, he restores your soul. But if that won't be in the valley forever, it comes to pass. Amen. This too shall pass. And eventually, God is going to bring you again on the mountaintop. Because guess what? We are on a journey. And this journey is a journey of valley. And it's a journey of mountaintop. There are times when God and when God can bring you down low, amen. And there are times when God can bring you up high. Make them understand that even in Christianity, and I tell some young men I go with, they say, look, they're going to have seasons. Uh, no season is the same. Let them understand it. Just like you have four seasons in the year, you're going to have seasons in your Christian walk. You're going to have summer, you're going to have winter, you're going to have autumn, you're going to have spring. No, no, you're going to have times where you're going to be happy. You're going to have times when you're going to be called for ministry. You're going to have times where you're going to People will use you a lot, even as a new convert, even as somebody who is growing. Amen. They will have times where you're going to be used a lot. Let them understand the realities of Christian work. But they're going to have times where you're going to be left alone. Amen. They're going to have times where you're going to wonder if nobody's seen you. But guess what? In those times, don't be discouraged. In those times, find your place and find because God have a way of restoring you in the in, in your Arabian desert. God have a way of bringing you through the valley. And then when you come out like Jesus, you come out in the power of the spirit. I tell people, there are seasons where God will use you mightily and use you enough. And then you might be seasoned, you might not see me for a little while. It don't mean that I'm backslidden. It just means that this is just not my season. And, 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 and not every season is mango season. And not every season is Aki season. There are times when there are teachers, there are times when there's need for preaching. It doesn't matter. Let them understand the reality of the Christian work. And therefore, that's how we train them as new converts. Praise God. Teach them how to walk in Christ. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent you your faith. As by some means, the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Let them understand that you teach them how to walk in Christ. Let them understand that there is a walk in Christ and you can walk this way. And Because guess what? Paul said, if, 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 if I can't teach you these things, Paul said, look here, you feel like all that he has done is in vain. It's like you have a child and then from morning to night, the child is sick, 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 sick. You're, you're gonna, you're, I mean, you're going to feel a little discouraged. Any period would feel a little discouraged. People say, oh my God, you're labored and at the end of the day, there is nothing you can do. And no matter how you try, you, know, you understand what I'm saying? At the end of the day, it's important that we try to teach them how to live a victorious life. That's what we're training them, how to walk in Christ. Praise God. What we train them also, well, that's it, number five. Now, how should we do new converts here? Amen. For the sake of time, I'm going to look at three points. So we're going to look at number one, make a special effort to have a class focused on the new convert. All right. So the new convert must have their special class. If, if there's a church, and I encourage all churches to try to implement this, no matter how small it is. So you have um, people getting saved, then you have a special class for them. So the class run from September to September. So, so persons who come in at, in, in September, you know, by August, they're out. Um, persons who come in in August, and they have a curriculum that runs, right? So from September to September, you have a certain set of topics that you will teach, amen, that are focused on the new converts, Christian living, Bible doctrine, holiness, uh, uh, tithing, 
whatever, these basic stuff, you pass it on to them and your focus is on the new convert. So as they get saved, you point them to the class if, and, and you have somebody who documents when they come in and if the new converts curriculum runs for a year, wherever they start, you know, the day, the Sunday before, that is where they end. You know, that means that you would have teachers who, who are special for this particular class, I mean, persons who are very learned in the word, I mean, I have novices, in most cases, it's the pastors who teach no convert care. But in some churches, you might have the pastor having somebody else along with himself, I mean, or somebody who has trusted to, who, who handles the world well to deal with the new converts. So you have to make a special effort to have a class Focus on the new converts. I mean, you can't, I'm saying before, you can't show the new converts where the meat is because they're not ready for that. I mean, give them what they need. Next thing you must do for new converts care is that you must pray much for them. So, I mean, so the ones who the pastor and the and even older saints, when they see new converts, pray much for your new converts. Jesus spent and Paul spent much time praying for them. And I, I don't put the verses here, but we're going to deal with that uh, next week. And assigning mentors to them. Amen. So at the end of the day, you have to ensure that you have mentors in the house of God. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19, 24 says, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly to you. Now here it is that Paul is saying uh, he can't be everywhere, but he has assigned Timothy um, to go to the church of the Philippians, who was his, Paul was the one who poured into Timothy. Timothy now reached a state where he can send Timothy to flip. To the, to the church at Philippi uh, to, 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 to uh, mentor them. So I'm going to talk about that right after this. So I trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to send Timothy or shortly unto you that I also may be a good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded. So here this Paul is saying that, look, at the end of the day, I've invested so much into this man that he has become like-minded who will naturally care for your state. So you understand the heart of Timothy because in a similar way, he had a similar heart towards Timothy. Amen. He was the one who mentored him. For I all seek their own, not the things which are just guys. But you know the proof of him that as a son with the father, he had served with me in the gospel. So he said that him knowing personally, he said, I'm not sure if I went come or whatever the case is, but I'm going to send Timothy. Amen. And Timothy was the one who was sent to mentor them. Uh, the last part, we pass it on. Mentorship is very important in new converts here, which is the last point I just made. There's a quote I saw that John C. Maxwell, who we know is one of the leading teachers on the whole era of leadership and, and all of that, but he, he had a quote in relation to mentorship. And he said, leadership is not about titles, position, or flowcharts. It's about one life influencing another. In other words, leadership, according to him, is influence. So what we have to do is ensure that there are others that we influence them and we pass on some of the stuff that we have. I tell people all the time that uh, whenever I teach any course or I teach anything, the, my aim, and a teacher said it to me, and I, and, and I start me this, and then the same thing, I pray God that I can do the same thing. If I teach you or you are coming with me, my aim is that at the end of the day, you become a better teacher. When I hear some of these young men preach, I, I'm, I feel so blessed in the Lord. I said, God, the thing goes on. Amen. That's what I like. So all the things that I teach and how I teach and how they are seeing that. And they say, okay, that is effective. But let me see some guys. This is my foundation. And I'm building on top of that. So I'm influencing others, not just influencing them to follow me, but influencing them to be better than me. Whoever wants to be the pastor after Bishop, Bishop aim should be that this person will be a better pastor than he was. Not that you want to, not understand the point, you know, not that you're not working to be the best pastor that you can be, you know, but there are certain things, amen, you also treat them so well that at the end of the day, your, your, your best becomes their foundation and they're building on that, amen. So, Based on statistics, thousands of new converts are lost to God and the church every year because they are left alone to grow by themselves. In other words, we can't allow the new convert to grow by themselves. There must be some level of mentorship. If they don't respond to appeals from the pulpit, they are soon left alone. In other words, not all new converts are going to be preachers. Amen. Not all new converts are going to use the pulpit, but it does not mean that they should be left alone. Amen. We must remember that we are a body. Amen. And not all the body speaks. Amen. Any day I wake up, praise God, and my ears is talking, I'm going to run away because that should not happen. My All my mouth speaks in a similar way. 
everybody who is a part of the body is going to be mouth. Not everybody going to be brain. Not everybody going to be hand. Not everybody going to be foot. But every part of it is important. And any part that is not working properly will cause a problem. Amen. If I get up tomorrow and my foot start act like my hand, I will have a problem. So we have to understand what we have to do is bring them in and put them in their place. Amen. So there is a place for every man and every man must be in his place. In other words, we have to guide them into the level of, into where God is calling them. Amen. And let them understand that everywhere God has called them is important. Amen. There's no, there's no less important place. Not because they do not please me, they should get less respect. All right. So at the end of the day, let them understand that every era in the kingdom of God is important. Preaching is important, but similarly, persons who, who come and all they can do is play an, and play an instrument and probably that's all they, that God has gifted them to do is important also. Because then the probably can exegete the verse and whatever the case is, but they learn enough that they can spread the gospel, they can tell somebody about Christ, that's sufficient. All right? And let them understand that don't let people become discouraged because they're, they're not called for pulpit ministry and they're not called to be big singers in the house of God, which are two ministries that people look up to. When people watch the streaming, they look for the singers and they look for the preachers. These are the two things that, that are the most important. I will understand because these are the upfront ministries. Amen. But they play a very every role in the house of God, play an important role. And we have to ensure that we mentor people to understand that fact. Wherever God has called you, wherever God has placed you, you can grow. Because at, at that day, when you are being rewarded, you're not going to be rewarded because you're a preacher. You're going to be rewarded because you have done what God has called you to do. All right? Which is very important. So Paul said to Timothy, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit now to faithful men who shall able to teach others also. Notice that there's a progression. I mean, there's a chain of reaction. So Paul teach Timothy, Timothy teach faithful men, the faithful men teach others. So here's an excellent example of what we call spiritual multiplication. Paul passes to Timothy. Timothy now passes to the faithful men. We know he was one of the pastors at Ephesus. I will see in the verse where I go with power to send to Philippi, similar case. And then the faithful men that he has no mentored when passing to others. Important that we do that. And that that way there is a level of multiplication being passed along. Praise God. The last thing I want to say, last two slides left. We understand that there is a principle of mentorship that is passed on even from the Old Testament. And this is very important because the one of the most important verses in the Old Testament is what the Jews call the Shema. It's so important that they, 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 they would put it on their forehead, they would, they would write it on the, the doorposts, everywhere, the Shema. But how do they pass it on? Look at it. Here is where the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Note, you teach them diligently on, you know, just teach them, but you teach them diligently. That's the aim to teach the new converts what the things that we have learned, the things that we have learned in the kingdom of God. Teach them diligently unto the children that comes into the house of God, and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be at frontness between thine eyes, and thou shalt write upon the post of thine house and on thy gate. The point I want to make is that notice Jesus use an example of mentorship even from the Old Testament time that they should pass on what they this whole era of who God is. That's why the Shema is very, very important to the Jews. Pass it on to them as a child. Teach it to them. So when the new converts come in, there's some basic stuff that they must be impressed in their hearts. They must know that God is one. They must know why you baptize in Jesus' name. They must know why we why you need the Holy Ghost. There's some stuff that we must pass it diligently. We now just walk over it and we are studied out and we're passing it on to them diligently so that they too can pass it on. I want to close with this last quote. It said, a mentor is someone who sees more talent and ability with you than you see in yourself and helps to bring it out of you. And that's a very important quote I want to close with. So as new, as saints, as a church, we must see more in the new converts than they even see in themselves. I mean, when they come in, you should be looking at a future evangelist. You should be looking at a future pastor. Amen. Look far ahead. Amen. I want, you see a new singer. You see a future this, a future Sunday school teacher, a future, you know, see more in them than they, that they, that they see in themselves. They don't see it right now, but a true mentor understands that, look here, this is a new convert. And in new convert care, my aim is to get you to a state of maturity so that at the end of the day, God can be glorified. 
and, and, and God gets the glory out of all that is done. I pray God that as we, I would say that we have just started new converts here, but next week we're going to jump at a, a at another level of, 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 of this particular topic, which is practically a whole era of discipleship. And we're going to realize that discipleship moves further than just the new converts here. We're going to realize that it, 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 it's all throughout scripture. And Jethro um, was a mentor to Moses. We find example where Moses himself uh, had had mentored Joshua. We find a case where Elijah and Elisha. So from even from the Old Testament, I will realize that the whole era of discipleship, I mean, uh, passing this on to people is very important and something that we see out throughout scripture. The book of Ruth portrays Naomi as a mentor to Ruth. All of these things show different, different passing on. And this is what we're going to be looking at as we look at the broad era now of discipleship next week. I pray God that there is something that was said tonight that somebody was blessed and that somebody will try to implement these things as we see the new converts come in. Amen. Our aim is to bring them to the fullness of the measure of the statue of Christ. God bless you. God bless you in Jesus' name. I pray, God, that you were blessed tonight by the Bible study. I pray, God, that you have learned a lot from this session tonight. Amen. In relation to the whole subject of discipleship and new convert care. And I pray God that you not only learn mentally, but some of these things that you have learned that you will try even to apply. Try to get a mentor as you are a mentee to somebody else. Try to, to, to all those things that we have learned. Try to see if you can apply to even these new converts that have been saved in our national convention. And watch God do a great work in our assembly. Bow your heads as we close out in prayer. Great God, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we have learned something from the word. And we ask God in the most mighty and exalted name of Jesus, that we'll not just be hearers of the word. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be good mentors. But at the same time, help us, Lord Jesus, to allow somebody else to pour into us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be accountable to somebody. Help us, Lord Jesus, to find good role models in the house of Lord that we may follow them as they follow Christ. I pray, I know God, for our bishop, our pastor, that you'll continue to lead him and to guide him and to inspire him as we follow him ultimately. And above all else, Lord Jesus, help him, Lord Jesus, to follow Christ, to be an example to the flock. Touch each and every one of us as we continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Continue to bless the house. Bless the house of faith chapel. Bless the house of, of, of the faith apostolic ministry body. In the mighty and the most exalted name of Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Note, I uh, pray for the... Um, continue your praying, pray for the services that are coming up over the weekend. Continue to pray for each other and help us, Lord Jesus, that we make it together. God bless you. Have a good evening in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.